welcome to First Class Counselors, where we give camp counselors insider tips and advice on how to make a camper summer the best it can be. Because you might be new at this. You might have kind of just figured out what this summer camp thing is all about. But no worries. We are here as First Class Counselors to help you be the best counselor you can be and change lives. My name is Oliver Gregan. My pronouns are he, him. And I'm the executive director at Camp Winona YMCA in Leon Springs, Florida. And my name is Matt Wilfred, pronouns are he, him, and I'm the director of overnight programs for Campfire Circle. We are an organization that brings the camp experience to families and kids affected by pediatric cancer. Yeah, let's get into today's topic. So perhaps you have heard of Angela Duxworth's book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, or maybe you have been on the campfire circuit, the summer camp circuit, going to all the conferences, and you've gotten to Listen to Dr. G or Dr. Deborah Gobella. She was on our show. Go back and take a look at Once Upon a Time and about her speaking about resilience and how to build that with kids. Um, and even, even um, if you listen to some people on YouTube, you may have heard of this guy called Jimmy Donaldson, also known as Mr. Beast. Um, I recently listened to him on a talk show where he talked about uh, his grit, his ability to overcome and you know all the time that he spent making YouTube videos before he really started becoming the famous person and the crazy sensation that he is uh, today. And we started thinking about here at the podcast about what is this thing called grit that is so important that we do every single day here at camp and that we find in successful people all over the world. So <clears throat> this idea of overcoming obstacles and pushing through tough, tough situations is a part of camp every single day. And we're going to get into it a little bit. So while camp may be full of fun and games, it is also this learning opportunity for campers, this growing opportunity that we talk about all the time. So today, let's identify some key areas where grit building can be found on camp and what you as a counselor can do to help in its development while still being someone who's caring and supportive of that growing camper. So first off, I said fun and games. So Matt, can you kind of start us off right now with what are some things about camp that are fun and games, but are still gritty, right? It, we're supposed to have fun, not struggling, which is what I think about when we get to grit. So talk about these fun and games of camp grit. Yeah, Oliver, in our, in our show notes, you, you mentioned, you said, isn't camp all about fun and games? And my first answer was, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Camp camp is about fun and games. And on the surface, like anyone walking into your camp's property or when in your like promo videos, if you like YouTube, like what is summer camp? You're going to see like happy, smiling kids and their counselors running around uh, laughing and playing games and going on water slides and uh, shooting a bow and arrow and like laughing and chanting and singing around a campfire and, and camp is that a hundred percent that's that's what you see but what people don't see or what we wouldn't show necessarily in a promo video is like a kid being challenged because kids are pushing themselves out of their comfort zones in every single way every single day at camp their physical comfort zones their social comfort zones and their mental comfort zones especially because we are constantly putting kids into new situations and we do that because we want them we want them to grow but we also want them to have fun and sometimes a kid has never water skied before or a kid has never been in a sailboat before and camp offers this really cool experience for for things that they can do but also as the world is evolving and changing with technology you know being in like a social situation sleeping in a cabin of kids is really really fun if you've done it before but it's not fun if it's your first time and a kid is snoring or it's, if it's your first time and you've been away from home um we'll get into all the situations why you might need to, to develop some grit but it is all in the means of having fun and growing along the way. It just doesn't look like it in your conventional thought of everyone holding hands and skipping down the camp path. Um, and, you know, we, the thing is we can't always as camp staff, we give you a lot of tools, tips and tricks on the podcast, but we can't always control the times when campers are going to be pushed a little bit further than they're ready for when their comfort zones go a little bit, a little bit much and they need to develop some of those those grit and resilient skills 
But what we can control as a camp staff is how we respond to the situations when a camper is at that moment and how we can help them develop their grit and build some of the coping skills that they'll need for the rest of their lives so that they don't need adults, they don't need their teachers, their parents, um, their caregivers, they don't need those people in their lives because they have built those skills. And the benefit of being at camp, even in a day camp experience, is that we are there for them. This is a supportive environment. It's Yes, it's fun. Yes, it's games. And yes, it's laughs and smiles. But it's also people that care deeply about these kids. As camp staff, as counselors, you you are their caregiver for the week. You are like their parent. In, in law, they would call it in loco parentos, right? That is meaning that you are parent-like for them. And there's a lot of trust and support that you're gonna offer those kids as they push themselves. And in this episode, we're gonna kind of talk about um, not not just like the situations that you were where we're gonna face where they're gonna need those skills, but we're gonna give you some actual concrete skills and tips and tricks on how to help foster that grit. Is that what you were looking for, Oliver, when you when you baited me with that question? Is camp all about fun and games? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely baiting you for it because. For me, it, it, camp is about fun and games, right? We're not denying that at all, but my first note that it comes in here is learning through play, right? Mm-hmm. This whole idea that in order for kids to learn socially or how to um, mentally handle difficult difficult situations or problem solve, play is an excellent and possibly one of the best ways to do it because it reinforces positive, uh, positive incidences to learn through, right? Um, and think about it. If you've ever been a part of team building, right, you play games to learn important skills on how to work with other people, right? That's exactly what it is. And through play at camp, campers get those opportunities to be gritty, right? To get into a game where they're losing and they have to come back, right? To play a game of simple tag where they're it and it feels like they're it all of the time. And to an eight-year-old, that's a big deal right <laughs> to us it's it might be frustrating but to them it's an experience of building grit like how do i get out of being it how do i get out of being the person who's always it how do i do this and that game is a way for them to experience something that is a little gritty but it's fun it's still a game right and if you've ever been a counselor uh or you've ever ever worked with kids and you've had that kid on the sidelines who's upset and a sore loser because maybe they are it all the time and they just can't figure out how to get on it they are in an experience of building grit so play is a wonderful place to do it mm-hmm. not only that but talking about this fun if you think about camp it's a giant sleepover that's an exciting experience for any kid right well sometimes a little bit intimidated maybe if it's their first time but sleepovers are generally accepted by our culture as an exciting thing to get to do you get to go over your friend's house you get to stay up late you get to eat snacks and popcorn and drink soda and do things that you normally can't do on a normal night and it's fun but also for a lot of kids it's the way to develop grit it's a way to develop that independence not just by being away from home maybe and being away from mom and dad and having to learn to be independent from your parents structure but also being gritty by learning about how to do that with other people maybe for the first time, right? What are their needs that you need to accommodate to while you're living in a cabin with them, that you're living at camp with them, right? Maybe somebody is a slower walker. Maybe somebody is a snorer when they go to sleep. Maybe they talk in their sleep. Maybe they walk out of bed in the middle of the night. These are all things that happen from that fun sleepover that camp is, Mm -hmm. that is living together, right? Going more, going down that line further, developing a skill. I love talking about how learning is one of the most difficult things that we do and developing a skill is learning. And I think it's absolutely incredible that that is an ultimate way to build grit because you've never done this thing before. You might have adjacent skills that come together in order to make that skill possible for you. But when you're going to shoot a bow for the first time, right? You might not hit that bullseye on the first shot. You might not hit it on the second shot, third shot, fourth shot, 50th, millionth, right? But for those campers who are developing grit at camp and want to hit that bullseye, doing that skill repetitively and practicing, 
which is a huge thing, right? Practice is important at developing grids. You'll see that in developing a skill, they will start to develop that grit because they know that it takes practice, time, and consistency to eventually reach a goal, which I think is really incredible. The next is dealing with adversity, right? At camp, you don't have the normal people around like mom and dad or your parent uh, or your parent structure to solve the problems for you. You're, that adversity is either A, going to be you solving it, or B, you finding someone who isn't the normal person you ask for help to help you out. And that takes grit to A, ask for help. That's something we've definitely talked about on the show before, but also B, to leave your comfort zone of people you normally go to, to new people, right? To deal with the adversary that you're going to face at camp. And those problems that you face at camp can be a lot of things I just listed, right? But going to new, new forms of help and trying to make those new friends, right? Trying to make those uh, people who are now your peers that you're getting to see behind the scenes, right? You go to school every single day as a kid and you see your friends do this, your friends do that, but you don't get to see that every kid does indeed brush their teeth, you know, that you are have to be on, that these kids learn that they have to be on par with kids their age of, you know, getting themselves dressed or showering on their own or remembering their shampoo when it's time for showers, right? These are all things that are developing grit and independence that we're going to really harp onto today. Now, I list a lot. We still have a lot more to talk about. So let's move into some of those places that we do see grit developing at camp. And Matt, you have some really great examples here. Yeah, Oliver, I don't remember if I have talked about this on the podcast, but it would shock me if I haven't yet already. Um, and it's the theory of flow by a guy named Mahail. I'm going to butcher it. I, I tried to learn. Mahaili Chiksent Mahail. I believe is his name. Um, and he is a, um, a philosopher and a psychologist, and he has come up with the theory of flow. And the theory of flow basically says that um, when we find flow, we find like true happiness. But we only find that when the challenge that we are facing equally matches the skill that we have in relation to that challenge. So for you math dorks like me out there, you have your mastery, your level of skill on the Y axis, and then on the X, that's the vertical axis for you non-math dorks, um, maybe like Oliver, no, just kidding, Oliver. Um, and then on the X axis, you have your, your level of challenge. And so when X equals Y, or for you non-math dorks, when the diagonal line is created between those two axes, you have flow. So for instance, you can think of it, um, we can find flow in a lot of things in, in the everyday, in, in work, or maybe playing tennis. Tennis, let, let's use tennis as an example. Um, for me, I'm like not a really a tennis player, but I can hang out playing tennis. So for me, playing against someone of my pretty like equal skill level is gonna put me into a state of flow. I'm feeling good about what I'm doing. My challenge is very equal to this. But if you put me against a harder opponent, then my challenge has exceed my my um my level of skill is lower than my level of challenge and when my challenge is greater than my level of skill that can put me in that pushes me out of my comfort zone i can start to develop anxiety or frustration um or feeling despondent or feeling like i like i just can't do it on the other end if you put me and said matt you're going to play tennis against a three-year-old that I, then my challenge level is so low and my skill level is so high that I get bored. So that dysregulation of your skill and your challenge can be a condition where, where we're going to have to summon something within ourselves to find the best of that situation. And often at camp, we're going to talk about when the challenge level is, is higher, because like we said off the start, we're pushing kids into their comfort zone physically, socially, and mentally. So their challenge is higher than their skill that they currently have. And we want to help give them the skills to increase their skills to match that challenge. I could talk about flow for an entire episode um, because I love it so much. It, it changed the way that I see the world, but 
because the thing is camp camp isn't going to be a place hopefully where they need to overcome extreme adversity right when you when you read about grit or you you hear stories even like the mr beast example that oliver said off the top like that's a pretty extreme example that someone like had to like grind it out making videos and now they're the richest one of the richest people in the entire world like the most popular youtuber like like it, it's not that severe at camp, hopefully, but those moments of dysregulation happen. And um, Oliver, I think, is going to give you a specific list coming up, um, but I want to give you a bit of a framework that I thought from some of the mental health um, stuff that I've learned about can be a really cool way to look at moments when a camper is being pushed um, out of their comfort zone in that. And that's with the acronym HALT. Now, HALT stands for hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And the answer to a lot of those things, the first step is to HALT, to pause. But think about all the times at camp, if you've experienced camp before, hungry, right? And that could be physical hunger because kids are burning all off a, a ton of energy at camp. So tired, that's where, where tired comes in for sure. But hungry can be more than just wanting food. It can be a, like a mental hunger. It can be when you're when they're feeling um, like they, they need more of a challenge or they're feeling like they're um, like something isn't fair. They're hungry for justice in that way. That can also manifest as the second one, angry, right? And anger is totally normal for kids, right? Their frontal lobes aren't fully developed. They're like just figuring themselves out. They they everything is unfair um, or it feels like that, at least for them. So angry that, that can come up if they're lonely. Um, because we know that like, yes, a camper could be excluded from a situation, but also they could just feel lonely because they, they don't have connections to any, or they feel like they don't have connections to anyone around them. Um, so even being lonely in a crowd and then tired, like I said, camp is mentally and physically tiring, um, more than they get, especially if they've been in front of their computer, um, because of COVID or just in front of the screen all the time. They're out, they're on their feet, they're away from their phones and, and hungry, angry, lonely, tired is going to come up a lot. And you can't build grit if everything is hunky dory, right? So we need those moments of dysregulation. And we, if we do it well, which we'll talk about next, we can leverage those moments and help campers start to build those skills. Um, but Oliver, can you, I, I kind of, talk big picture there. Can you break down maybe some like specific moments at camp when we're going to see the opportunity for grit to develop? Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's start with what we think about first off the bat as our activities, right? The things that we just do at camp. What are the ones that are going to develop the best grit scenarios for your campers? And really, I'll open it up and say pretty much any activity you choose is going to give them some form of grit, right? Um, like they have to do something in activity. Participation is the start of grit building. So please just getting your kids up active and doing something is your first challenge that you need to overcome for your own personal grit, right? To get kids to do something that maybe they don't want to do, but also for those kids to get up and do something is the first step. So now you got them doing an activity. What are the activities and how do you make them really do some grit building? So I like to see activities that require some form of problem solving. Uh, and this can be seen in a couple of different areas. So one is maybe it's their first time doing this activity. I personally love canoeing, right? Kayaking, kind of easy. You find it out on your own. But canoeing takes two people. And they need to kind of figure out how that boat works, right? If you've ever watched two kids in a canoe for the first time and they just start spinning in circles, right? And then they there gets to this point where they kind of maybe either A, give up or they figure it out. And here's the deal. The kids are eventually going to figure it out. You might need to coach them a little bit from, you know, your boat. But learning how to canoe is a skill that most kids are going to be able to pick up within due time. So learning that skill, going through that process is a great way to do it. And it's through problem solving, right? You can also add problem solving to the activities that you're doing, right? I like to try and think about it as putting strategy into an activity, right? So for an example, when you go to play capture the flag, right? Capture the flag, really common game. You got to run across the other side, grab the flag and come back. Super easy to understand. Becomes a grip building activity when you can pull your kids together and say, hey, look kids, look team, 
we need a strategy. We need to, we need to outsmart the other team, right? Help, let's build this strategy. What do we want to do? What are our jobs? What are our responsibilities in order for us to work as a team and accomplish this goal, right? Now it's not just let's go grab the flag. Now it's, all right, let's build a team and your responsibility is to be on defense. Your responsibility is to go and get the flag. And everyone learns that they have their roles that they play in order to make this job or this activity work to accomplish what they want. And mm -hmm. it takes grit because at the end of the day, they're problem solving. They got to think about a solution, but also now they have to fall into a role that helps the greater whole. And it's team building essentially, right? But also you're putting yourself in, the, these kids are putting themselves in a position where you know they have to complete a challenge. Right. And that's by adding strategy. And you can do that in a lot of different things. Most sports can have have that added to them. Um, fire building survival. That's a great gritty area uh, of camp to get involved into. Um, my camp has paintball and 100 percent. I work that in. I grab a big whiteboard. I grab the kids over and I'm and I talk flanking. This is now we're going to flank the enemy. Right. We're going to distract them with a few up here. You guys are going to really start off fire really heavy. Lots and lots and lots of shots, make them duck for cover. That's going to give our time for these guys to sneak around the backside, right? I'm teaching grit by having the strategy out there for them, or I'm having them try to come up with those strategies on their own. So that's, that's one big area that I do it. Another thing is choice activities, right? Hopefully your camp does form some form of choice activity, but the idea behind the choices here is that, not all choices are the best choices that kids want to be a part of, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been that person on camp who has helped like divide up your clinics or your learning periods or activities. Like smorgasbord was, I think, what I called it back uh, when I worked up in New Jersey. Free choice maybe is what your camp calls it. There's a lot of different names. But at the end of the day, a kid picks an activity and they go to the activity and that's it, right? It's their choice. They might get to see like a show or something like that or a pitch for why they might go to the activity, but that, that's it. But then that kid goes to that activity and they are miserable or not miserable, but maybe just don't want to be a part of that activity anymore. Your job as a counselor, yeah, make sure the kid has fun. If Can you adapt that at program to make sure they can enjoy it? But I really stand at this point of saying like, hey, look. I want you to understand you made this choice to be in this activity. I want you to stick through it. You know, it's an hour. Maybe it's two days that you actually have to be in this activity. Overall, it's not going to ruin your entire camp experience, but also you get to be a part of something that you didn't expect was going to be a great time. And if you buy into it, maybe, maybe, just maybe you'll learn. And I have a wonderful story that I can tell from personal experience. If you ever want to hear it, send me an email. I'll answer it. But it, being able to sit there and talk to a kid and say, hey, look, sometimes the best things are things that we get through the difficult beginnings with. And that helps those kids develop grit. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they might have been put in drama and they are not a drama kid at all. And all of a sudden, by the end of the week, they are singing at the top of their lungs, standing on the front stage because they found something that they could, they could really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then you can have that conversation with that kid at the end of the week of being like, man, wow. I'm so proud you stuck through it. And here's the kicker though. The opposite happens too. You, you get that kid who wants to stay in that activity and they get to the end of the week <laughs> and you go and you talk to them and they're like, no, nah, man, that was the worst thing I've ever been a part of. I can't believe you made me stick through it. And you're going to look at them and you just say, okay, but you got through it, right? Mm -hmm. Guess what? The next challenge you face, you're going to get through it easier. That's right. The next thing that comes into your life that is a challenge for you that you may not be ready for, you may not want to be a part of, guess what? You can handle it. You've been through it. Because at the end of the day, that kid needs to learn that sometimes in life, you're going to get some really bad hands thrown at you that you just have to grit through. And that's an excellent thing. And I love choice activities for that reason. I want every kid having fun, but I also want these kids growing. So I try to make those experiences supportive and I try to be there for them, but it's a really important one. The next one, um, staying on that theme of choice, challenge by choice. I make sure that kids choose what their challenges are. I use, a lot of camps will use this, use this at high ropes, but I say this all over camp. Everything at camp is challenged by choice. It's your choice of what challenge you want to take on today, right? Every day is different. Every challenge is different. How you feel about it, it's up to you. 
at the end of the day, the kid is still having the choice of how much grit they want to put into it. So how much of the flow for that day is really going to be in their favor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important because again, part of grit is living with those choices that you make, right? Uh, I think longer scheduled activities is really important for kids nowadays. Uh, I think because a lot of activities only last an hour to an hour and a half, that schedule for kids means that that's all that activity. Like if you think about it, when a kid goes to school, they're in class for an hour to an hour and a half. When they go to practice, they're in practice for an hour to two hours. When they are doing their homework, homework is supposed to last an hour, two hours, meals, an hour to two hours. Everything is within these time frames. What happens when you have an entire day unscheduled to yourself? Or a canoe right? trip, right? Or you're going canoeing. Or a canoe trip. Canoe trip, yeah. Exactly. Um, longer scheduled activities help kids develop grit because they need to learn what to do with their time to make it productive, right? Their schedule becomes their choice. Again, their schedule becomes within their power of how they're going to have fun and make this time entertaining for them or how they're going to complete this project without getting distracted, without falling, um, without giving up on this project, right? Longer scheduled activities help develop grit. So if you're looking at your camp schedule and you're looking at everything is between one hour to two hours, think about what you can do at your, with your schedule to maybe say, hey, look, this day is going to be different. This day is adventure day. We're going on a big old hike through the woods we're gonna, and we're going to have a bunch of activities that are littered through the day but nothing's supposed to be scheduled hour to hour to hour to hour. So everything is, is in line. Um, or maybe have a project that your kids are working on that they have to work on for longer periods of time, right? Whether it's an arts and crafts project, maybe it's a service project to get back to camp. If they're a little bit on the older side is usually that works really well, but longer schedule activities, huge way to develop grit. And then, like I said, activities where a product is, is developed I like this with older kids, especially service projects, but also anytime when a product has to be developed, there's some skin in the game, right? If you are able to produce something that people are going to see, depend on, um, or have in their lives for, the, for whatever amount of time after it's been created, it could be painting a fence um, at camp to make it look like a mural, so it's really pretty. It could be doing um, like... Um, Maybe it's building a new low ropes element. These types of things that maybe give back um, or planning an evening program. Sorry, go back a little bit. But these things where other people maybe depend on the product help develop grit because there's a dependency from other people uh, for you to have to complete that project. And it's a great way to develop grit for your campers because they have to grind through the struggle of developing this thing to make sure that it's a well-produced product for whoever is going to get to experience it and i think that's another great way to develop grit hmm. um but now we put them in these situations we have a better understanding of what they look like in those situations but what do we do matt really when that camper is struggling you know we put them in that gritty situation flow's not going so well um maybe the choice was too much for them hmm. what are we doing now that it's it you know how do we show that care and make sure that our camper is not falling apart on us. Yeah. And you know what we do? We let them struggle. We let them struggle a little bit. And that is hard. It is, is hard for so many different reasons. But we need to think about the long game here a little bit. We're not going to solve all of the world's problems in one week of summer camp. Although I truly believe that if every politician in the world spent one week at summer camp, the world would be a better place. But... Even though we're not going to solve all of a kid's problems or a kid's needs, we're not going to, we're, we are not going to be the be all and end all of teaching them grit. Camp, like Oliver said, is kind of a laboratory for developing grit. So these experiences that we set them up for, very intentionally, mind you, um, we know that the feelings that they're going to feel, the, the halt, the hungry, angry, tired, lonely feels, are going to happen for the rest of their lives and what better place for it to happen than at camp than like i said before the supportive environment of camp what we want to do is help them learn that they can be successful in the face of a struggle or a challenge and if we swoop in too soon we're teaching them 
learned helplessness. And, and basically that means that there will always be someone who will come in and help them. And, and this is a huge thing for, for teachers that it's in the education world that people are thinking about. And, and it's, it's a really hard thing to do because we don't like to see kids like uncomfortable, but there's a difference between a kid struggling and being uncomfortable and being completely overwhelmed to the point where they're not going to come back from that experience because they're so overwhelmed. Right. Um, and, and part of what we're, what we're giving you here are like, you're going to develop your instincts. It's just going to be something that you as a, a camp counselor are going to learn by watching kids be a little struggly with things. And what you want to be able to do um, is find the best moment for you to engage. So I'm going to give you kind of a little bit of how I think about engaging. And then Oliver has an amazing little kind of template of how once you do choose to engage, um, how you can do that. But when I think about this, um, I first of all, I know it's hard. I know it's hard because of the perception of, of like when I was a camp counselor and um, one of my campers was really struggling with a craft and was getting frustrated and was starting to like, you know, get on the verge of, of, of something really big. It's hard as a camp counselor because, you know, if the camp director walks by and sees you with that kid, you might think that the camp director thinks, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with these kids. And in our last episode, I talked about that was like a mistake that I made was I, I tried to make everything perfect all the time. And I forgot about the long term gain of this. And most camp directors will kind of get it. But a tool that we used at a camp um, when I was at Pierce Williams that we taught the staff was a special hand signal. And that was I forget what the signal was. I think it was like your your um, your fist under your uh, chin. Like I'm thinking like the stoic posture. And that was the key for I notice this behavior and I'm choosing to let it happen very purposely. There might be a, a bunch of different reasons why you choose to let a behavior happen. There's another episode for, for us for the future, Oliver. Um, but that, that thought of I see what's going on and I'm going to choose to let this kid struggle. That international hand signal that you develop with your coworkers is a good way of helping you not feel um, embarrassed about the situation. So first of all, that kind of thing can help with your mindset. For me, I work with my camp, I work with the staff that I work with now, and I've asked this question when I was a young staff member is, what is our threshold as a camp of how long we're going to allow a camper to struggle? And this is my, I'm going to tell you my personal one, and you need to bounce this by your supervisors, your directors. I think every camp should know what it is for themselves. But for me, I usually wait until I notice a camper give up once. And that give up will look like a, a different thing for every other camper. They, so if they're on the, the rock wall, the, the rock climbing wall, they say they want to come down. That's once that's giving that's they're choosing to end the activity once. Um, or, you know, if they storm out of a group situation, they're choosing to end that activity. They're, they're, they're giving up once. If they toss the, like the craft supplies away from them, they're giving up once. And that doesn't mean they're going to give up forever. And even in that moment, I still wait an extra beat before I go in and engage with the camper because I want to see if they're going to build back that skill, if they're going to build that grit on their own without my intervention. And if they do it without my intervention, I'm still going to talk to them after and I'm going to say, hey, I noticed, I noticed that this was really frustrating for you. Tell me, but, but I noticed you came back from it. Tell me about that. So the kid gets to articulate and, and, and learn that they, they were gritty in that situation. But um, once they've given up once, that's when I kind of start to step in. Once they've completely disengaged with the activity, it's not, it's not impossible to bring them back and, and you might not, but you got to give them that chance first because that's the moment that they're going to feel for the rest of their lives, right? Think about them. Think about your camper 15 years later as a freshman in college when they have to do their first more than like five paragraph essay, right? Or they have, they have their first final exam come up and they're sitting in that room of 500 people writing the same exam. We want to raise the type of kid who's going to put their pencil down, take a deep breath, 
remember that they can handle those situations. They might not remember what that time they made it through that crappy arts and crafts session in that moment, but you have given them that tool by letting them build it on their own. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the first step is the very careful um, notion to not swoop in. But once you get there, you're going to use the tip that Oliver is about to give you right now. Yeah. So the, one of the important things is first off, get an assessment of grit of where your campers are at day one, like team building, icebreakers, those things. Once you kind of know, then you can start moving on. So let's start small and then we scaffold up, right? So in order to make sure our campers are being cared for while developing their grit, you have to be present. You have to be somewhere there at the beginning, right? And I like this very simple five-step process in my brain about how campers can develop grit. And I do this to not just develop grit in my campers, but with my staff. So you can use it across the board. And, the, and it's coaching strategy is really what it is. Number one, demonstrate, okay? Show how it's done, provide the materials or information, demonstrate, do the action so they can see it, right? If you are teaching them how to throw a ball, physically throw a ball so they can see what that motion looks like right? Because for some people that will help them learn. Demonstration, visuals, right? Get it off the bat. Um, now, if you're not maybe able to do it, right? Maybe it is something that is outside your zone, but you're still coaching it, you're still teaching it, or maybe you don't want to show them the answer as part of the activity. Provide the materials or information for them to get started on how to learn, how to do whatever this activity might be that they're coming in and you're trying to develop grit through. Next one is hey, I'm here, I'm right next to you, we're gonna do this together, right? So show them that they can do it with help, show them that you can be there and do it with them. Don't overbear and dominate whatever the activity is or the task, but you can be there to assist um, and, and show them like support is really what it is. Let them know that they're there and they're accomplishing it together, all right? Next up is the I'm there portion. So. I'm not here with you, but I'm there. I'm watching you from the sidelines. Think about like a parent at a kid's soccer game, right? They're there, they're cheering them on. You know, they might say some supportive things. They might answer some questions, right? But they're not doing the activity. They're not the one. Now it is time that they are developing grit. But they still feel the support is close by. There's still a safety net there for them that they can kind of feel, all right? Next is give them the task right? But you're doing it alone, right? Um, I like doing this one with staff. Maybe we've done this. Maybe it's something that they've done a couple of times with me. We've done the training, but now they got to go and they got to do it on their own. They got to run like archery on their own, for example, of a staff member. For a camper, it might be you got to clean the table in the dining hall on your own, right? It's day three. You've seen six meals take place already at camp. You got to be able to handle wiping the table down at breakfast on your own, right? And then I will check your work. So I'll check for the adequacy of it, make sure you did a good job. And then I will come back to you and give you an evaluation. Say, hey, look, great job cleaning that table, man. So happy you can do it on your own. You didn't need me. Fantastic, right? And then lastly, it's the it's yours part, okay? This is, they're taking over now. You're not checking their work. unless If you notice it's bad, you obviously got to say something. You backtrack a little bit, but you know what? That table in the dining hall, good to see you cleaned it. Your bag's in the cabin, good to see that you're keeping them tidy. You made your bed this morning, wonderful job, but I'm not checking it anymore. It's up to you to be able to do this on your own. And the reason why we do this scaffolding method, Psychology 101, is because eventually you want your campers to go home with that grit. You want them to leave camp after a week when you are no longer supervising them to do these things and that they're doing it on their own, right? They develop that independence They've overcome the difficult obstacle of learning how to care for themselves or how to play in this game or whatever it might be. And now, and now you've walked them through that process to make it a lot easier for them. And they felt supported the entire time. They felt like they were cared for. Okay. Now, some really important things is how they respond to the challenge though, your ability to read what's going on. So first off is your language. And it really depends on every single individual that you work with. Some really need direct language. Hey, look, you got to get this done. This is up to you. Like this struggle is yours and you have to accomplish it. They, they take it very directly and that's what they need. 
They need this kind of, hey, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat what needs to get done here language. And that's okay. Not everybody wants that language. Not everyone can handle it. Sometimes that language is too far, right? Sometimes a camper who maybe is used to that language, this is not the moment for it, right? It varies and it is hard, but it's a, I say it's typically up to a gut decision for you as you learn how to work with people. The other side is supportive language, right? And I think supportive language is important. Hey, I'm here for you. I can help you with this. Um, you're going to be that person um, who's letting them know like, hey, look, you've got this, right? This is positive language. It's great. Um, I will say the negative, just like I said with the negative for the direct is with supportive, you need to make sure that when you're given the supportive language that you're there for them, that eventually you're going to let them take this over on their own, right? You've got to let them know that this supporting from you can't be what's replacing their personal motivation to accomplish the task. To go into that, motivation is also a huge part of this. Do they have intrinsic motivation where they're pushing themselves or extrinsic motivation to accomplish this task, to overcome their grit? Hopefully it's intrinsic. Hopefully it's coming from within inside them. They have a passion to overcome the obstacle that's in front of them, right? Other things you might have to face when someone's coming across grit is do they have learned failure, right? This idea that they can't accomplish the task. Maybe they've shot that arrow a thousand times, never even hit the target, right? How do you come in there and demonstrate, right? Be there, right? Or be here, be there, right? Get them to a point where they are willing to shoot that arrow again and try and give something a shot where they don't think like, if I do it again, I'm just going to fail, right? So that's important, right? Make sure that they don't have that learned failure. Um, and then lastly, making sure that they stay focused, okay? It's really hard, especially nowadays, we talk about a lot with kids and shortened extent extension spans due to many different variables with um, our younger generation. But um, how do you make sure that they are on a task that they can stay focused on and not give up on or not get distracted by something else or not try to find an easy corner that they can cut? And that's really important to help them develop that grit um, and keeping them focused on task. And those are really my methods for when I'm saying, hey, you're working with a kid who's struggling with grit. How do you get through this? How do you help them and support them and show them that you do care and you want them to be able to handle this on their own? And I think verbally, like that's something I coach with staff all the time is I, I say out loud, hey, look, in this moment, I'm really trying to help you develop your grit. I'm really trying to help you develop your independence. I want you to be able to do this on your own. Um, I want you to do this without my help. I want you to be able to think that this is possible without Oliver. Um, I want you to show other people how accomplished you are. This is all language that you can use to motivate them. Um, and the goal is, right, is once you have these people who are your campers or who are your staff and they have this grit that's developed, they can, like I said, go home and <clears throat> um, be able to take this grit home and handle more tasks and obstacles as they go throughout life. And I, And that's why... I'm in camp. That's why I really enjoy it. So with that being said, Matt, do you have anything that you want to leave off before we move to the end of the show? Well, Oliver, I, I love, I love your, your like step-by-step -step approach with that. And I think you gave some real concrete tools there. The one thing that all kind of plant as a seed in your mind is, is how can you also, how can we also help campers kind of direct that conversation a little bit that you, you have with them? Um, and, and the way that I do that is I like to ask questions and the perfect example is a kid at the rock wall. Um, the, if I'm belaying a kid and they want to come down, the first thing that I say to them is I say, okay, that's an option. That's totally a choice. And letting them know that like they have the autonomy in this situation. I'm not going to leave them <laughs> hanging at the top of the rock wall. Um, and I want to help them make the choice to keep going. That's my goal there. I want them to make the choice. I don't want to force them into it necessarily. But the way that I can help them choose to make that choice is I can ask them questions and I can ask them about their experience and then I can help give them different perspectives on um, on the situation. So a kid top of the rock wall says they want to come down. My first question, I say, okay, that's totally an option. Can you tell me why you want to come down? 
And that is going to give you that one question. Can you tell me why you want to stop this arts and crafts? Can you tell me why you want to do this? They'll say, well, because I, they might say, I can't do it. And you say, oh man, that's, that's tough. It really sucks when you feel like you can't do something. What, what, tell me like, what is it that you can't do? And on the rock wall, they say, well, like, I can't reach this spot. I can't, I can't get any higher. And I might say the question, okay, well, what have you tried so far? And they'll tell me what they've tried, or maybe they'll realize they haven't. I'm asking questions. I'm asking about three or four questions before I'm offering some advice. So a kid says, I, you know, I, I can't get any higher. Okay. Okay. What have you tried? Well, I've tried this, this, and this, and how did that go? Well, it's not, didn't work. Okay. Have you tried something like this? Have you tried using your left foot instead of your right foot? Well, my left foot stuck. How can I move it? Well, can you put your right foot instead of your left foot? And I'm guiding this whole conversation because if you think the goal of the rock wall is just to get up to the top and come back down for kids, then you're not seeing the true purpose. It's not just the fun and games of getting to the top. It's the fun and games of trying to push yourself out of that, out of that, that flow state, encourage, or if the goal is to get into that flow state and to find it. And you have to adjust the challenge and you have to adjust the skill level um, and help kids doing that on their own is that's the ultimate goal. Um, and is it going to take longer to do the arts and crafts session or the rock wall? It might take a little bit longer. Um, but I think that that's why we have so much time at camp. You can, you can reschedule and move things around if it's in the name of giving kids that experience where they push through adversity and develop that resilience on their own. Yeah, that tip of asking questions is amazing because at the end of the day, you're not on top of all of it. You're not providing an answer to the camper. They're coming up with the answer themselves yeah. and they're learning to problem solve themselves in difficult situations, right? So when they leave camp, right, and they face a difficult situation, they will start to ask themselves, how do I solve this problem? Mm -hmm. That's what I, like, that's what I had to do before. I had to solve the problem. And I did it through my own brain. My own brain waves had to do it. There wasn't just an answer there for me. And that is the, Honestly, Matt, to leave off the show, that is the number one thing <laughs> that I think that people can can do. Like, if you don't know what to do as a counselor, you're sitting there at archery and you have a kid who's like giving up. You go, all right, what have we tried? Okay, cool. All right. Um, do you want to try again, but maybe change your method? What would you change? Right. Yeah. These simple questions inspire that thought process for kids to be creative and try and solve their problems. And another thing that you can do is if you have that kid who's not coming up with options, not like just can't think, maybe they're at a point where they can't think, maybe you give them three options, right? You say like, okay, mm -hmm. well, do you want to try with this, this, and this, or would you like to try with this, this, and this, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have to think about it and they go, okay, that one, the second one, I want to do the second one, right? All right, cool. But here's the kicker with that. And it's a little bit manipulative at the end of the day is the kid, when they're answering that question, they hear two options and the two options are still to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. That that's third right. option, that, that third option to like give up, it, it's not dawning on them. They're, they still have to think about, they think, okay, I have two things I can do, mm -hmm. but the two things are to complete the task and their mindset starts to become, okay, I have to complete the, like these tasks. Now, can I say, and again, it is a bit manipulative, right? Like you are tricking a kid into moving forward. Um, we'll talk about the, the, the negatives of that in the long run, maybe another mm -hmm. day. Um, but I think the positives definitely outweigh it. And you're, you're getting that kid to overcome a task and become more gritty and handle more difficult situations um, because they are. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't provide that choice option if I didn't know that the camper couldn't complete the task, mm -hmm. right? They're, they've just gotten to that point where they need that pseudo encouragement. Well, yeah. and the, ben the and benefit, the benefit of asking questions too, is that like you don't need to know the answer <laughs> necessarily, right? Like you don't need to know the final answer. You you get the kid to give you information, um, and and you and you come up with it from there. When when a kid says like when a kid says I'm bored, that's a ton of information. If they say I'm scared, that's a ton of information for you to start asking questions and unpacking. And you can help. You get to be the person to help alleviate that boredom and scaredness. And I would much rather a, a camp counselor do the 
I'm putting air quotes up, manipulative thing of giving them two choices that you want them to make than for a kid to, to miss out on an experience that they might love. So for me to say, do you want, if they're archery, for your example, the, my two options are, do you want to step closer to the target or do you want to pick a different target? And I, I've used that so many times and the amount of kids that just like pick a different target and that's enough for them to get them out of that funk, you're, you're helping them do that. I, th I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a, a manipulative gift that we can give them. Oh, I've definitely, I've definitely pulled the, you know what? I think the wind's made a little different on target two. Do you want to go try target two instead? Oh man, I'm shooting so much better at targets two. There's so much less wind. So yeah. much, and I don't know how to break this. And now, and then you can be like, well, well, let's, let's see if now that you are an expert shooter, go back to that target and then bingo, bingo, they get it. Yeah. Done, right. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, that's plenty of show for today, but I know we always want to do more. So please check out the other uh, shows we're doing. But while we finish today, we always finish with something a little bit, uh, a little bit more fun, a little something to put in your toolbox. And that is our Eggle, the ever growing, ever learning. It's a trick, a tip, a game, a song for your counselors, uh, for you as counselors to use to be better every single day. So uh, Matt, I'll kick this one off because um, I got a little inspiration. We had a Girl Scout troop here this weekend and um, they had these things called special, whatchamacallit, affectionately pinned somewhere, also known as SWAPs. So for those Girl Scouts out there who've been doing SWAPs for a while and didn't know, it is an acronym. And essentially it's a bobby pin, like a little like clothespin kind of deal. It essentially can get put onto clothing or something. I've seen hairpin styles as well. And you glue little tiny um things onto it i've seen people make little canoes out of popsicle sticks i've seen s'mores I've seen little campfires made out of cloth um super cute little things give it a google search um, but the idea behind it's really cute they do it during their camperies so they'll sit down in arts and crafts they'll make like a hundred of them and then they'll you know give them out as presents or gifts to other troops and other girls that had positive impacts on them throughout their weekend or throughout their camping trip and then the other girls get to wear them on their vest or put them on their backpacks or keep them just wherever they want to keep them as a memory of the weekend. Um, typically, they have like a troop number involved with it. So you know who you got it from. Um, so maybe a name or, or, or something of that sort. But it's a cute little campy themed um, way to show appreciation. And I, I just love it. I think it's great. A special whatchamacallit affectionately pinned somewhere. I love it. Super cool. Cool. Good angle, Oliver. Okay. Mine is a board game slash a phone app that you can play with people, uh, depending on your tech policies at camp, you might not do this, but it's a great thing to do with other staff. Um, if you're allowed to have like phones and you have Wi-Fi to play it, or I think you can do it on Bluetooth, it's called Space Team. And I'll put the link to both the board game and the app in the show notes. Um, but Space Team is uh, one of my favorite things to do with, with like a, a medium, small, smallish group of people. Um, essentially, the, the story is that you are on a spaceship that's flying through space but is like constantly falling apart in every aspect of it um but the funny thing about it is that all the names are super weird so like the, the whatchamacallit could be an actual part of the space station um and when you play it on your phone if we, you're sitting in the same room as people it has to be done in the same room um, you cannot do it over Zoom. I tried and it failed terribly. But essentially, you on your phone, you have a piece of the spaceship in front of you. And um, and an inst also an instruction that comes across the top. And the instruction on the top will say like, set the whatchamacallit to six. But you don't have the whatchamacallit on your phone. Your friend across the circle has the whatchamacallit on their phone. So you have to, but you don't know who has it. You have to verbally give the instruction call out to the group, set the whatchamacallit to six. But that's happening as the rest of the group is calling instructions as well. So they're saying, move the doodangler to the medium setting. Um, and But you don't know who has the doodangler. And if you don't do it in time, part of the ship falls apart. Or like an asteroid comes and then everyone, somebody has to yell asteroid and everyone has to shake their phone to get the asteroid to stop from hitting the spaceship. It, it is chaos 
Stop. And speaking about grit, man, oh man, <laughs> you can develop some mental grit by playing this game, but it is also a ton of fun. Um, I haven't played the board game version, um, but it is on my list to get because it is super duper fun and I'm excited to bring it and play it with some camp staff and maybe even some older campers this summer because it is going to be a blast. So check it out. Check out our show notes. Um, we put a lot of stuff in the show notes for this episode. So please do check it out and we will, um, you can find out how to play and then I want to hear about it. Tell me about your space team experience. Yeah, it is a great game. Personal opinion. Fantastic game. Great to do during staff training with your leadership team. Mm. Um, but if you did enjoy today's show, uh, we would be so grateful if you left us a review wherever you are listening to the podcast. Your ratings and reviews not only tell us what you like or don't like about the show, but it helps boost our ranking and helps more people to discover the show. Also, uh, Matt got a few emails that he uh, sent on to me this week. So please um, reach out to us because we'll do a show about the things that you're looking for us to talk about. Um, great emails, great feedback from you guys. We're really excited to look into some of those show topics. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for sure. And, and in some cases, we'll even have you on the show. If, if you want to share, if you have an experience from this summer that you want to share um, from how something went, you dealt with a situation you weren't expecting, come on the show. Let, let's talk about it. I'm sure there's there's many things that we haven't yet covered that um, every camp staff would, would benefit. And, and one of my favorite things about the camp industry as a whole is that we are all about sharing ideas. There's so many kids in the world um, that don't go to summer camp that there really is no competition in our camp industry. Um, so we're sharing our best practices. That's, that's just what we do. So um, if we can start that even on this show, I, I love it. That's great. Um, and just don't forget that to check out our show notes, gocamp.pro slash FCC is where you can find them. And you can also uh, see other Go Camp Pro podcasts and talk, hear about what they're talking about. Um, we did, our last episode was about our biggest mistakes and the Camp Hacker podcast also did one on a camp director level. So that's kind of fun uh, to listen to from both perspectives as well. And you can find those at gocamp.pro slash podcast. Yeah, with that being said, thanks for listening, friends. And remember, camp is camp and camp's all good.